Thanks, Sarah. Gosh. I'm, I'm from Canada, not used to being flattered like that. Jeez. Thank you. So uh, it's great to be in Ireland. Really awesome. First time here to Dublin and uh, came here a bit early. Been here for a few days just to hang out and, and check out the scenery. Bit of a bit of a crack, gotta admit. I, I, I kind of, I, I think I remember doing a solo rendition of My Funny Valentine at a pub a few days ago. So anyway, it's been good. Uh, and always, always a pleasure to be at Google. So I'm going to talk about mobile marketing optimization today. That's why we're here, right? Now, are you guys going to be like American and involved? Or are you going to be sort of Canadian and subdued today? Because you can totally, you know, respond, all right? I'm okay with it. I am Canadian, but I'm into it. So how many of you remember February 23, 2014? No? Okay, so this was an epic moment. This is when Canada scored three goals against Sweden to win Olympic gold medal. You're laughing. This was awesome. Okay, so how many of you watched the Olympics, Winter Olympics? All right, cool. So if you did, you probably searched on your mobile phone at some point to find information about the Olympics. 63% of searches about 2014 Sochi were on a, from a mobile device. Last year, global mobile traffic, uh, in terms of bandwidth, grew by 81%. 52% of Americans say their phone is their primary email device. Their primary email device. 70% use their phone in their bathroom. Which is why you should not buy a used phone. Okay, so here's an email I just got recently from McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey Insights, they have an app for Android. This email is unreadable on a, my, my phone. I have an iPhone. I can't read the email. What does this say about their ability to create an app, right? There's a halo effect here. If I can't read their email on my phone, do you think I'm going to want to download their app? Probably sucks, right? Can't read this. The column's too wide. They're, what's their value proposition? Every experience your customers have with you creates a halo effect. It implies your value proposition. Your credibility is in question. If your landing pages aren't mobile friendly, your visitors will leave. So, we know this is important, that's why we're here. But how do you do it? What, how do you improve your, your, your mobile optimization? Well, first of all, I wanna start with a definition because I think there's some confusion about what is mobile. I was talking with Justin and some of the others earlier this morning about how do you define mobile? A lot of people think mobile is the difference between a desktop and a phone, right? You've probably got digital managers or analysts coming into your office and saying, you know, showing you a report, saying our mobile users act a certain way and our desktop users act another way, as if they're different people. Some people, if you're really advanced, are, are looking at tablets, right? Because this is, I mean, a, a third type of device. But that, this is not reality. This is not mobile. The reality is there's an infinite number of devices now. There's infinite number of device sizes, screen sizes, iterations of devices, and they're, they're changing all the time. BMW has a web-ready car. Is this a mobile device? It's, exactly. It, it, it's the, this is an automobile device. It's the definition of a mobile device. Is this mobile? Yeah, of course it is. Is this a mobile device? No, this is not a mobile device. Okay, so you got to stop thinking about mobile as the difference between a phone and a desktop computer. Okay, mobile is not just about your phone or your tablet. Mobile is a state of being. It's a context. Mobile is a verb. It's not a device. So think about when you're talking about mobile, how do people use mobile? Why, why is this different? It's because they're in a different context. They're in a different environment. This implies a different need, right? A different way of usage. Uh, here's an example. I'm going to show you a few examples today, and I'm going to show you some frameworks. I'm going to show you some processes that you can use. So there's some, some practical things you're going to take away. I'm just going to start with some of the context here. Uh, this is Indochino. 
Indochino sells custom suits. So you go on, you can measure yourself and get your custom suit created. It's kind of, it's pretty cool. They get them, you know, they're using outsourcing and global logistics. But on their website, they've done something pretty smart here. This is their desktop site. And uh, there's a few sort of calls to action or actions that people can do on the website. Book an appointment is a primary one, or you can join, contact us. But on the mobile version, they've created a responsive site and they've dynamically changed the priority of the calls to action, the messages, and the design to focus attention on what's most likely to happen, what's most likely to be needed in a mobile context, not just on a mobile device. Often responsive is, you know, it's very popular right now, right? Responsive web design. You guys are probably redesigning your sites right now to be responsive. Sorry about that. That's painful. Um, but if you just create a, a responsive site that compresses all your information into the screen size, you're, you're missing the opportunity of responsive and of mobile marketing, of thinking about what do people actually want in this context. So they've prioritized book an appointment with an in-person experience. That's more likely to be the case when you're on a mobile device. You're out on the road and you want to find something no nearby. Another page on their site, they've got their uh, personal style guide, their traveling tailor, right? And so. On the desktop site, they've got the, the locations where you can get, get measured, and they've got more value proposition content. Now, they can improve the design. Sure, there's a lot of things you could do from a conversion perspective on the desktop site. But on the mobile site, I like what they've done here to focus the above-the-fold experience on the one thing that's most important in the mobile context. Find the, your local location. That's pretty smart. Okay, so... Here's something a little bit shocking. Um, in 2000, the average attention span of a human was 12 seconds. This is just sort of general population, all right? In 2013, it's eight seconds. This is not just mobile. This is like the average person. Okay, we've got some catching up to do, right? There's some challenges here. Humanity's facing, yeah, a little bit of an inflection point, perhaps. Uh, and this is a challenge for marketers, because on mobile, it's even worse. On mobile, you have distractions all around you, don't you? So you've got to communicate your message with clarity, with speed and efficiency. I got this email from, or this, uh, actually, no, I, I searched for something. On, uh, I got to a Marketing Land landing page. And you'd think Marketing Land would know what they're doing, right? This is unreadable, illegible. And the worst enemy of any marketer is this little icon that Apple's created, which strips away every revenue-generating opportunity and just delivers the content. Now, for me, this is great. Now I can read it. But Marketing Land will never sell anything to me. I will never go to their event. I'll never sign up for their newsletter because it disappeared. Danger zone. Um, I uh, ended up on Threadless.com. Uh, it's a t-shirt company in the U.S. where you can order all kinds of clever t-shirts, right? So I arrived and I thought, first of all, this is fantastic. Look at this. It's a mobile design site. Shop, participate, blog. Shop all $10 tees. This is just one big button. Perfect. Beautiful. I can't go wrong. Like, there's only one place to click, right? Bam. $10 t-shirts. So I click on it. <laughs> wow. Impossible shopping experience. There's no way I can buy from this. And so recent research, unfortunately, shows that 100% of mobile shoppers will not do the impossible. It's good to know. Uh, and what's happening now is that marketers are becoming terrified uh, of the mobile experience. And, and they're, just, they're, they're freaked out because they know that it's so different. They don't know what to do. And a lot of marketers have actually just given up. This was eMarketer. And, and so they created their mobile site with all kinds of content, which is great. No, no calls to action at all. But you go to their desktop site, and they've got all these revenue-generating opportunities. They've just given up. They're like, you know what? Forget it. Mobile, like, we don't know what's going to happen there. Let's just give them the content for free. So don't do that, right? Your mobile visitors are actually, it turns out, ready to buy. They actually do want to buy. There's a pile of revenue ready in mobile. So let's not panic. Let's look at how do you optimize for mobile? How do you make the most of it? I'm going to show you some processes that you can use to continuously improve your mobile, all right? First of all, there's three components to mobile optimization. 
Uh, it's as simple as this. This is the, the sort of the high-level overview. Number one is persuasion marketing. And this is where you learn how to move your prospects to act, how to create motivation in your prospects. Persuasion marketing is all about psychological principles, about creating value proposition, about communicating with clarity. So that's the first component. And then the second component is the experience design. Once you've created motivation, how do you facilitate that action? That's all about user experience. It's more about the rules, about you know, how do people interact with this new device. And the third component is critical, is also uh, part of it, the scientific method, where you test to find out what works within these other two areas. That's really all there is to it. Simple and very difficult. Mobile has particularly unique challenges. It turns out that those are the three principles of every type of marketing optimization. But in mobile, you've got you know, the screen size constraints. You've got environment. You've got speed. Download speeds are still slower. Uh, attention spans, all the distractions around people. And this is a, these are significant challenges, of course, as you, as you know, um, but also opportunities for you because you guys are the cream of the crop. You're here learning how to do advanced marketing optimization for mobile. And by testing and finding out what really works, you can leap ahead of your competitors because most of them still don't know what they're doing. Nobody does. Okay, this is a cool, just an example of what I mean by that. The best user experiences for mobile are still being determined. They're still being figured out. This was Washington Post. They have this uh, little translucent icon. Now, this may not be the best experience, and it may not be the ideal, but it's something different, and it's designed for mobile. You, you click on that, and, and you know, up comes a new uh, menu. They could have done things better, but clearly this has been designed as a, as a mobile-friendly, mobile-only experience. You're not going to see this in a desktop. And there's going to be all kinds of new experiences that are going to come out that are specifically designed to facilitate mobile. Okay? Here's a test we ran just recently. It's a very simple one. I'll show you an example. So uh, we've got an affiliate networking site, or affiliate marketing site, that uh, has tons of traffic. And we work with them on a continuous basis to optimize to generate more revenue. Now, this was, so they had content below the page. This is a mobile page. And there's a banner for getting car insurance quotes. And this simply was isolating, OK, which of these icons signifies that there's something here to look at? So there's a little down arrow, there's a plus, plus symbol, and this one adds a little value proposition, three steps, you know, simple process. Okay, so we've got a couple examples here we're going to go through, and remember, keep this informal. We're going to guess your conversion skills, see which one you think won. All right, so how many think A with the down arrow is the best experience? Who's going for A? Don't be shy. Okay, a couple A's. How many going for B? The plus, all right, plus fans. Who's going through the three steps? Whoa, beautiful, look at that. Brilliant. Oh. <laughs> well, okay, you're wrong. But if you voted for A, hey, give yourself a raise. That's like, look at that, 6.8% revenue lift, direct top line revenue. Beautiful. Except, turns out there's a little left hook here. Uh, without the icon was actually the best. Totally remove that, and uh, bam. So that's just one like, example in a, a continuous string of iterations um, that build on that learning. So the point is, don't just take this and say, oh, you know what? Pluses work way better than little arrows. And removing them totally works best, because I can just see the blog post coming out now. right? <laughs> Plus signs are way better than down arrows. No, that's not the point. The point is, in this context, for this ad, in this environment for this target audience, that was the best experience. And so we can take that and figure out the why behind it by continuously testing to understand the customer. That's the way to improve and find out what really works. OK, so good news. Now, we've been optimizing since 2007 at Wider Funnel. And what we found is that the process is exactly the same. We've been optimizing on desktop, on apps, within video game platforms, on, on desktop computer games and in mobile apps, mobile sites, and the process is the same. If you think about it from a customer solution perspective, from a conversion perspective, understanding the customer and removing their barriers, it's the same system. Okay, so let's look at that. So here's a high-level view 
of the system we've been using to optimize. And you can, you can adapt this, take whatever parts of it you want, you know, slice and dice it. What's important is that you have in your organization a process and a system that's rigorous that you follow consistently to continuously improve. Where a lot of people run into problems is when they just go and, and search the blogs for the top tips for conversion optimization and just go and throw them onto the website and say, you know, Justin Cutroni said this should always work. And uh, <laughs> uh, he would never do that. Um, but, but uh, you know, you're on the HubSpot blog, right? Because their content is brilliant um, until you test it and it doesn't work. So here's how it works. Start with uh, a planning phase of really digging in to understand your customer. What we do is we involve a lot of uh, heuristics, qualitative information, surveys, the messy part of understanding your customer with analytics, the hard science of looking at data at where people move. This is a really messy process. There's nothing clean about it, but it's a, it's a part of understanding who your customer really is. And then from that, we take the insights and the strategy that prioritizes where to emphasize your effort and then go into the rapid cycle iterative testing. Now, the, the steps are in a very specific order, starting with creating hypotheses, right? An analysis of the page, the experience, creating hypotheses, creating a plan, designing it, implementing experiments, and most importantly, step number seven, which is often overlooked. When you run tests, Dig into the results to try and figure out the why behind it. That leads into much more powerful insights that can lead into further testing and back into the strategy. Because ultimately, the whole point of this whole thing is about understanding your customer. So believe it or not, your customer is not you. Your customer is different than you. And you've probably spent a lot of time trying to understand your customer, right? You've been getting into their head and you've been looking at the research, the data. But every, everyone has a unique filter. So the information that you communicate, you, you, you write some beautiful emails, amazing prose on your landing pages. But what you say is filtered before it hits their brain. And you don't know what this filter is because it's, it's, it's influenced by their demographics, their psychographics, their experiences with your company, with your competitors. The only way to really know what they experience is by testing, to find out. How do they really respond? Okay, so how do you get results like this overall? In, it's about asking powerful questions, okay? Because the, the one thing that will determine your success in conversion optimization are your hypotheses. So you may have hypotheses about segmentation. Now, how you validate that is to test different forms of segmentation against no segmentation to see if it actually makes sense. That's one hypothesis. A value proposition uh, positioning is another hypothesis. Uh, design and layout, these are all questions that you ask of your audience. And the more important your questions are, the more valuable your results will be, and the more powerful your lift will be from that. So I'm gonna show you a framework that you can use. Uh, it's it's you know, become very popular, and I'll show you how this works. Uh, and it turns out it works for mobile too. So this was a search I did for iPhone cases. And I'll give you the punchline. I still don't have an iPhone case, so clearly it didn't work. I uh, clicked on the ad. Here's a landing page, Invisible Shield for iPhone 5. So if this was your company, you had this landing page, you designed a, a really cool video. It actually was a, a pretty good video. Uh, how do you improve this page? How do you approach it? Well, you need to, what's that? A call to action, yeah, how do people respond, right? You may have some ideas about what would improve the page, but structurally, what you need to start with is identifying the barriers to conversion. Start by saying, what, what are the problems that me as a, a shopper would have landing on this page? So one of the frameworks we use is called the lift model. It's for used for categorizing and thinking rigorously through your, con your conversion barriers from your customer's perspective. It's about understanding those filters that are on your customer's minds when they arrive on the page. So I'll describe this to you and show how it works, okay? So the core of it is the value proposition. Now, every good marketer has their own definition of value proposition, so you probably have one of your own. I like to think of it as an equation that goes on. In the prospect's mind, when they're on the page, 
between the perceived costs of taking action and the perceived benefits. If the benefits outweigh the cost, they'll have motivation to act. Right? So that was that first wheel in the conversion VIN. If it's negative, then they'll bounce immediately. That's where your bounce rate comes from. Now, you can test within that to find out what are the value proposition triggers, perceived and otherwise, that will move that needle. Right? Is it social proof? Is design creating more credibility? Are there features that are specific that trigger action? That creates value proposition. All of the other factors just subtract or, or add to that, that communication. Okay? So relevance of the presentation. Is relevance to the source media? Well-known uh, uh, principle of scent trail. Right? If someone's coming from a, an ad that has a word, if that word is in your headline of the landing page, you've created that scent trail. Turns out we're just animals. And we, we surf by scent. We have triggers in our mind. And you know when we're in the forest, we're looking for the smell of a deer. Uh, we're on the web. Turns out we're looking for patterns. We're pattern matching. And so that creates relevance. Right? It's one of the principles. Clarity of the presentation is clarity of the eye flow and the imagery and the call to action. Clarity of the communication of the value proposition. How, how clearly and quickly do people understand your value proposition? And anxiety is anything that creates uncertainty in the prospect's mind about taking action. We've done some tests where it turns out that putting too much emphasis on security symbols on an e-commerce site can actually reduce your sales. Because it gets people thinking about security and anxiety. And in reality, they should be thinking about the new pants they want. Right? Distraction is anything that redirects attention from the primary message or the primary call to action. And then, of course, urgency. Why should they act now? What are the motivators you can get them to, to move and act at the moment? Okay, so that's a high-level view. There's actually 27 sub-factors, uh, but you know, that'll get you started. And, and you can definitely make huge progress just thinking about the six conversion factors. Okay, so now looking at the page, now we have a framework for thinking about what are the barriers in this experience. So relevance, the ad said iPhone cases. That's not in the headlines, no, nowhere on the page. Right? There's too much space taken up for the tabs. That's a distraction point. There's no content above the, of the page. There's nothing about the value proposition. Now, there's a little error here. The, the type spills off the page. Um, the video image actually is compelling. Like, this is a, a, you got a hammer on your phone. That's a visceral image, right? That creates a reaction. Uh, so that's good. The problem is that when you click on the video, it opens up in a YouTube uh, app. And of course, we all love YouTube here, but you know, after you're finished watching this marketing video, you're going to have all the Katy Perry videos that you've been watching earlier, right? <laughs> so that's a distraction. Admit it, you've got them on yours too. I know. Last time I, <laughs> I was in this presentation last week in Indianapolis, and I said that. It was the first time I'd said that. And that was the most tweeted thing of the whole event. I give us all this conversion optimization wisdom, and they're saying, Chris, admitted to watching Katy Perry. Anyway. Uh, okay, so there's no product information about the fold, most importantly, right? So it gets worse. Come on, 12 product options on my mobile? To f like, I don't know what the difference is between full body and maximum coverage? Like, what is that? Give me full body maximum extreme. I don't know. Uh, okay, so then I clicked on the About tab, and finally we've got some great product information. So military grade patented material. This is incredible. This is really good stuff. Why wasn't that on the landing page? Huge missed opportunity. And it gets even worse. Now, if you have a mobile app, you are going to immediately, or a mobile landing page, you're going to immediately go back and, and start stress testing. I know it. Because I clicked on the search tab, which is where I landed. They'd used a custom search query to create their landing page dynamically, which now disappeared when I clicked on the tab to go back to it. Don't do that. OK, so now what you do, here's how it works. Take all of these problems, right? You're going to have dozens of problems, but don't just go and fix them. Test them to find out what works, because some of them you'll be wrong about. So you take all the weaknesses, flip them into strengths, and those become hypotheses you can test. So too much space for tabs. OK, reducing the tab navigation height will lift your sales. That's a hypothesis you can test. 
Now the art of the strategist comes in where you have to decide, okay, which ones of these are actually important to test? Which ones do I want to cluster together to create swing for the fences improvements? Which ones are going to drive to important insights about your audience, right? Isolate for insights, cluster for improvement. It's the principle. Okay. So, talked about how you create hypotheses, how you test. Uh, but turns out, as I said, the process is the same for mobile and desktop, and it's important not to think about a, a silo. And I hope in your organization you haven't created a mobile marketing department or a you know, mobile marketing person that's separate from the rest of your marketing group. Because your mobile visitors don't exist. If you have an analyst coming into your office and saying, this is how our mobile visitors respond, this is how our desktop visitors respond, kick them out. You don't have mobile users. You just have customers. They might be on a mobile, they might be on a desktop, they might be in their car, but they're all your users. They're all the same people. Uh, this was Nikesh Aurora from Google. Apparently he's just recently left the building, but uh, he was here until a couple months ago. He said people aren't distinguishing what they're doing on different screens, so you have to be more agnostic about where you reach them, right? These are people that are, they might be on their couch, on their laptop, with their tablet beside them and their phone in their pocket doing different things at the same time. It's the same person. Now what we're finding is really interesting, I'll show you an example of this, is taking the desktop tests, gaining those insights we've talked about, feeding them into the mobile test to see what works, and then vice versa. And, and some really interesting things come out when you do mobile tests it, it turns out you have to be really, really focused, right? That's the challenge with mobile. Uh, and sometimes you can get so focused and, and clear on what your value proposition is that you can actually learn some really interesting things that can then improve and, and create a, a much better desktop experience to begin with. Because often marketers, you know, if you're given too much space, you're going to get lazy, right? Admit it. We're all marketers here. I, often we're going to go and, you know, someone will bring a landing page to us and say, you know, can we optimize this landing page? And they'll have a long copy landing page and it's, you know, beautiful copy about stories and how people use the product and just amazing writing. And you'll get down to the bottom where they've run out of words and the last paragraph, they finally say what they mean and it'll be like the perfect encapsulation of the value proposition right at the bottom. So I encourage you, go back to your office, find your landing page, look at the bottom, make that your headline. Sometimes you'll just boost your conversions right there. It's the same thing with mobile, right? So you've tested on mobile and you've found the perfect, you know, very concise, smallest way of communicating your message. Now take that into your desktop and you'll often find an improvement. Now, this is just a simplified view of two segments, to your point. You might have a segmentation test where you're looking at different traffic sources. Then you're going to say, oh, traffic from Google search or, you know, from, from organic, from ads versus organic or email uh, versus Facebook and social and all of these other areas might respond differently. Well, let's look at the insight from each of these and see if they can feed into the others as well. So there's, in principle, two ways that, that insights can come about with segmentation. One is pre-planning, right? Guessing what your seg how your segments will act and then testing to see if those actually respond and work better. The other is to look at your tests and then at the back end drill into the data and look at how different segments act, creating hypotheses about why they acted that way and then running tests to validate and confirm. Okay, so this is a, a real example from one of our clients and, and how this works in process, okay? So thinking about how this will work overall in your uh, continuous testing process. We start with a page and we've got a bunch of hypotheses, right? So say there's five hypotheses, this is a real example here, where we've isolated to find out which ones are going to drive improvement. So we've got an improvement, we've got some that are not improvements, but they generated insights. There's, there's never a losing test. You have a losing test, now you have some information about what didn't work, you can infer the why behind it and build on that. Now that feeds into the next test, where we've got some more improvements. So that was a 7% lift. This one was a 16% lift. 
And the next test ends up being a 24% lift. Oh, and we've got a whole other stream of tests on another page up here that are feeding insights down to this, this test as well. Uh, oh, it turns out we've got another round with insights feeding back and forth. And then when you start to layer in the mobile, look at that. There's desktop and mobile feeding insights back and forth to each other throughout different segments, building on the learning about what actually works in user experience and persuasion and value proposition for your customers. So yeah, it can get a little bit complicated. And this is where you, know, you really need a dedicated team that's got their head wrapped around how your customers are acting and building on this learning. It becomes a whole knowledge base of your own internal playbook. All right? OK, because everyone wants tips. You're going to ask me at the end, give me tips. All right, here's some tips. I've given you strategy. Now you're glazed over and falling asleep. That's OK. Which calls to action? Which devices need which calls to action? What's the context? OK, how much information does each screen size need? Look at, at tablets and Androids and phones and different screen sizes and figure out what works better. Should you scroll? Should you have tabs? Should you open new pages? Images versus video. You might be surprised. Test that. Everyone's saying video is the shit. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Save for later. Links versus buttons. Single microsites. There we go. All kinds of tip, tips. That'll get, you, that'll get you started. Oh, and this one is a good one. If, you have, if you're generating, if you're a publisher, uh, generating re revenue from ads, and you've got a little banner at the bottom, you're never going to get anyone clicking on it. Because now they click on the bottom, and it opens up the little menu. There's so many still doing that. It's crazy. OK, so if you want to learn more, there is a book. It has everything I knew up until a year ago. And it still works. It actually doesn't go out of date. Uh, you can get a free chapter at iwant at widerfunnel.com. Just send us an email. Um, and we'll actually have a drawing there for three free copies of the book. So if you email iwant at widerfunnel.com, and we'll get you in that. And yeah, that's us. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah? Cool. And oh, look at this. I've been wanting to do this ever since I heard about it. OK, so if anyone has questions, I'm going to toss this green monster at you. <laughs> Apparently, you talk into the its bum or something. <laughs> questions? Come on, I want to do a Hail Mary. Anyone back? There? No? No questions? OK. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, that's all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to talk to the, Sorry. You got so focused on your question. Uh, oh, so there's a mic in its bum. Go ahead. Oh, talk here. There you go. Oh, I guess that's his face. Do we need to repeat the question or? Just briefly. Yeah. Um, it's about um, the resources that people How do you have. resource? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're not having unlimited resources at our company. What should we focus on, and what should we consider leaving a, uh, leaving apart for a while? Yeah, okay. Does anyone here have unlimited resources? <laughs> Justin, of course you do. <laughs> All right, good. So yes, a very valid question. Now, and you're right. Conversion optimization, it turns out, is uh, a multidisciplinary system, and and it's very rare to find one or two people that can do all of the uh, that have the skill to do all of it. Because you need to understand marketing clearly, uh, understanding the customer. You need to understand design, user experience, you know, wireframing. And then there's a lot of technical stuff as well. A lot of times the technical tests, how to speed up a, te uh, a page or, or, or you know, different ways of implementing tests are, are hugely important. Um, so, you know, and I mean, it's not a promotion thing. I'm not, I'm not here to promote wider funnel. That's what, that's what we've done is created this team, but it does take those components. So you want to think about how do you resource, look at what you have internally. Do you have designers, coders that you can maybe pull a portion of their time away to you know, focus on that? But you really need a conversion champion 
who understands the process for continuous testing and building that knowledge base, that's the most important part. Um, and, and, and that's what we've done. We've created these, these pods, these crack teams of conversion, um, uh, well, they're conversion teams, and they have the components of designers, coders, strategists, and, and account managers that go in and go in there and are like outsourced teams for, for companies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you manage to create a version stock for not to repeat the same thoughts afterwards? For example, you, you think you can improve by testing something and then you test uh, this works better and six uh, months later you wonder if the, the previous version would work better. Right. You haven't recorded the, the, the movements. Okay, so you're saying you've run a test, yeah. you got a winner, and then you want to check to make sure it's still a, yeah. an improvement? Probably six months later you are wondering if the previous version yeah. worked better on the test. Yeah, and it's always worthwhile going back and, and reconfirming. In fact, for this example that I showed with all the yeah. insights, that's what we do actually do that on an annual basis. So we'll go and we'll run tests for 12 months, and then we'll, we'll actually go back and pull the control from 12 months ago and retest it to validate that all of the improvements were actually cumulative. And over the past 24 months, they have been. So they've actually, when you do the calculations, the cumulative calculations, they've still been valid over 24 months. So it's, it's a really good idea to do, at least just to, if nothing more than silence the critics who are like, oh, come on, 24% lift, really? Is that really what's happening? Um, and it turns out it is. Like, that's, that's really how it works. Um, but also, there are seasonality nuances that you want to take into account. And look, especially if you have a seasonal business, we're finding, and I, I didn't show the example here because it's not mobile, but... Um, Examples where during peak urgency periods, the winners can change dramatically versus during lower periods because people's internal urgency is different and their response to different messages changes. So that's, that's one that's really worth revalidating. So it's not too bad to test again? No, it's, it's, it's worth doing, but give yourself some time, like run through a bunch of tests and then go back and validate and make sure that it's still working. If nothing else, that's a tech check to make sure that your, your statistical significance is working out properly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, almost. Do you have any kind of tips for dealing with um, hippos who uh, don't really want tests to kind of run to completion or don't want to wait for accurate results? <laughs> want you know immediate results and kind of say it's not a it's a commercial decision to stop the test now. You know? Yeah, that's so. You're digging into one of the biggest problems. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sacrifice your body for the team. Uh, organizational change is one of the the biggest barriers to conversion optimization, especially with senior marketers who have never taken this approach because it's a completely different way of thinking. Most marketers grew up in the gut feeling intuition school of marketing where you find out an insight and you, you run with it, right? And this is a different way of doing it. This is actually a, a, a merge, a merger of data and intuition. Uh, and so, yeah, you'll have people watching the tests who are impatient. They want to just finish it, and they're like, why are you wasting your time with all this you know, statistical mumbo-jumbo? Um, and so the first thing you want to do, what that we always try and do, is identify who are those people that are going to be barriers. Identify who are the champions and supporters. Run some uh, under-the-radar tests with the supporters without the, champ without the detractors knowing. Okay, Secret tests. And then get some momentum that way. So you've got some wins. You have some valid lifts. Now you, now you have some proof that this is a way that can genuinely lead to improvement. So you might not start on the home page, for example. Uh, and, and, then, you know, so, and then shop that around. And then, without them knowing, set up a webinar for the whole company. And share the results. Right? Yeah, get fired. No. Actually, you know what? That might be the best thing for your career. Find a company that supports you, to be honest. Um, but 
and then and then and then you can start. So you know, there's a whole bunch of tactics. Actually, I have I got a blog post about that. 13 tips for how to create momentum as a conversion champion. You know, do the lunches, start the Skunk Works tests, create momentum, do the shopping around results, build support, and you've got to get one beachhead in senior management that's an that's a supporter, and then they can fight your battles at the sea level. Otherwise, yeah, you're outmanned. Yeah. One row off. Yeah, Maybe got killed there. Uh, so it's probably similar to Gareth's question. We actually worked together. Uh, so we got two questions sneakily there <laughs> from the same company. Um, the problem uh, for us is uh, collecting enough sample size. So you showed us all these tests and iterating and iterating again. If we were to do the, the entire cycle and actually measure an actual revenue improvement rather than the micro conversion improvement, mm -hmm. it probably would take us 10 months. So um, any tips for people around here that actually struggle to get enough sample size to get a, a statistically significant result and run more tests. Yeah. Tra oh! <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, traffic is the biggest barrier to conversion optimization. It's true. And, and there's, there are a uh, few workarounds, but there are principles for lower traffic tests. So run more dramatic changes. And that doesn't necessarily mean dramatic design changes, dramatic cognitive changes. So it might be value proposition that's quite a bit different. Um, fewer variations, run away from multivariate, right? Just run two or three variations, run on your highest traffic pages with a few more variations, take those insights and validate on lower traffic. Um, and be, so some, okay, so you have to be comfortable with running longer tests. Uh, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with having tests in market that go longer. And you may even consider a slightly lower statistical significance if your traffic level is lower. It's still better than guessing and firing in the dark, um, but don't tell anyone I told you that. So, um, yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, more traffic is always more fun. It's just, it just is. <laughs> that helps. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about things you would not test? Because we have the problem that everybody loves testing. And when somebody is disagreeing, like, we should test that. So we have a roadmap now for the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Everybody apply for his company. That's awesome. That'd be fun. Uh, OK. So. But what you're talking about, it's like you've got an underlying question there, because yes, you want to test everything, and you've got total support for testing. But if you've got a roadmap for 10 years, that means you don't have enough traffic to support your desire to test. That's your problem. And really, that's unskilled testing. Skilled testing is looking at the traffic you've got, prioritizing what are the insights you want to gain from it, and testing what's important. I'll say that again. You have limited traffic. Every one of us has, except for Justin, have limited traffic. Okay? And you can only test a finite number of things. So I didn't go into the, uh, the strategy roadmap, but there's, uh, so you can Google something called the PI framework. It's a framework that we use for prioritizing tests, and it's all online. Uh, and doing that, you prioritize your test based on potential importance and ease. And by doing that, you will always be testing the most important questions for your company that generate insights and conversion lift. And then it doesn't matter how many you have, because you're always testing what's important. And only isolate to generate insights. That make sense? OK. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, do you hear me? Yeah, OK. Do you have a key takeaway for B2B online testing? B2B. Since I've seen a lot of examples for B2C. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, B2B. And of course, I have also a problem of lower traffic, so. B2B usually is more, has more likelihood of having lower traffic, it's true. Um, so B2B, yeah, we do a lot of testing on B2B. Uh, so you want to look at testing. The goal is really important in B2B, right? You may be generating leads. And you've got to look at quality of leads. 
So we do a lot of testing, for example, for Magento Enterprise, where they're trying to get people to, not, not on the e-commerce platform, but trying to get people to sign up. And so whenever we're testing, we want to track those leads through quality at the call center to find out, does this test generate more revenue or is it just creating more volume of leads? That's really important if you can. Uh, looking at uh, tracking phone numbers that go into the call center to, to go straight through to opportunity and revenue value. Um, and yeah, all the same principles of lower traffic ones as well. Uh, and staying away from interesting but non-revenue generating micro conversions. Now Justin's going to disagree in his talk because in, with analytics, micro conversions are really important to understand the context in your audience. But for testing, don't track micro conversions. They're different animals, testing and analytics. Okay? Yep. Hey, uh, even though the tools is not the most important thing, but I think the tools and the framework in terms of the what you're using to actually get this uh, thing rolling is important. Can you say a few words about how you approach project management for this? I mean, do you use one tool that you build in-house? Do you use third-party tools? Because uh, like taking away the technical stuff like calculating the statistical significance in Excel versus thinking about what to test is probably important. Yeah, okay, so which tools are best for testing? For, for tracking. For tracking. For having this as a project, right? So you start from ideas and end up with the insights and the results, right? Yep. So do you do it like in, in, on paper? Do you do it like in, in Jira or whatever? So what is the oh, the project system? management yeah. system, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's internal project management. So we have a mixture of our own internally developed project management tools, systems, um, that are customized for our system. Um, but yeah, I've heard Jira is good. Uh, you know, some people like Basecamp. Um, really, a, a lot of marketing project management tools can be used for, for conversion. We just like to have it customized so it's really streamlined for, for our system. Um, yeah, but yeah, I've heard Jira is really good. Give that a try. Yep. Oh, damn, getting weak. Hi, uh, my question is actually around uh, testing tools themselves, and yes. in particular, if you have any recommendations around testing tools for native apps. Yeah, uh, so testing tools, you know what? Oh, <laughs> got a haircut. Um, there, there are a whole bunch of testing tools now, and uh, there are several that are pretty good. So we've been using Optimizely a lot. Uh, it's, it's pretty decent in features, does a good job. Uh, Visual Website Optimizer is good as well. Uh, Google has content experiments. It's okay. Uh, there's uh, you know some other higher priced ones. Uh, Monetate, Maximizer, Adobe, um, SiteSpect. There's a, a whole bunch, but those are the ones that are easier to get into. And and then you usually want to, what we always do is combine them with the analytics. So when we feed variations in, those drive the tests and look at statistical significance. But then for context and for segmentation, you want to integrate it with your analytics, whether it's Google Analytics or Adobe usually, and, and make sure you're doing the back-end analysis too. Oh, there's also uh, AB Tasty in uh, France, and that's actually a really good tool, too. Worth checking out. Yeah. I need more beer. Hi. Um, you were talking about segmentation, how important segmentation is. How Segmentation? Se nope. Did I hear you right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you, for instance, get... And a bit says that your returning customers convert better than your new customers. Then what's your, what's the next step? Returning customers convert better than new customers. Yeah, and then you in a test you, you got like the result. What is any, what is the next step after that? Well, so that's you more like you want boss to convert. Of course. That's more like obvious. That's not as much of an insight because new customers. Returning customers will usually convert better. Yeah, just an example. But, but yes. Like so, okay, so the way, now what you'd want to look at there is not, if you look at overall and say, okay, new customers convert better than returning customers, there's really nothing there you can work in, work with. But what I'm talking about is if you run a test 
And then you see that returning customers convert better on variation B, new customers convert better on variation C, now you have a potential insight about the, the, the customers, the segments, and you can then drill into why. Why do they respond better, even slightly, than on the other one? And now you've got a potential insight that you can build on, create a hypothesis that now has a test that's targeted at that potential insight. And then you build that hypothesis into a finding which becomes a theory which becomes something you can use predictively. And that's when it gets really powerful. So there's eight steps. Now, I, don't have, I can't explain the whole thing now. There's eight steps to testing segmentation. Google wider funnel eight step segmentation. There's a blog post that'll tell you the whole process. Anything else? Or we're almost out of time. We've got a minute. OK, one more. <laughs> got to pay attention. Got to stay. <laughs> Keep your stick on the ice. You've as talked we say about in Canada. Um, iteration quite a lot, um, but I wanted to know how many tests you would run in parallel on an e-commerce site at various different stages within the cart. Mm. How many tests do you run in parallel? Uh, depends on the traffic. So it, it, you can run a lot of parallel tests as long as you've got the technical chops to keep the segments separate. So what we'll do is visitors will be pre-segmented before they get into the tests, and then within the segments we'll run parallel paths. Uh, but that's for an e-commerce site that has a lot of traffic. So we're talking you know, half million monthly, you can start getting into that. If it's less than that, then you usually want to stay at one or two parallel segments. And you, but you've got to be very careful if you're doing that to make sure there's no cross-pollution of tests, that all of the cells are completely separate. You don't have any, you know, any tests sort of intermingling because then you'll get really screwed up results. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I hope you guys have liability insurance here. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I can't. I can't.